Doctors with disabilities exist in small but measurable numbers. How did they navigate their journey? What were the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? What can we learn from their experiences? My name is Lisa Meeks, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Join me as I interview docs, nurses, psychologists, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and the list goes on. I'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that ensure medicine remains an equal opportunity profession. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the Docs with Disabilities podcast. In this special two-part series, Dr. Neera Jain, Senior Lecturer at the Center for Medical and Health Sciences Education at the University of Auckland and guest co-host of the Docs with Disabilities podcast, flips the mic and interviews Dr. Peter Poulos. In this episode, Dr. Poulos candidly reflects on his disability identity journey and how learning from a vibrant community of diverse individuals has elevated his thinking about disability justice. He shares insight into the power of community and how forming the Disability Resource Group at Stanford Medicine was transformational. Throughout the interview, Dr. Poulos and Jane thoughtfully reflect on shared experiences and their roles as advocates for individuals with disabilities in medicine. So we met in 2019 for the first time at the Coalition Symposium. And I remember seeing your name on the list and being like, oh, somebody from Stanford. Interesting. I'm interested. Who's this person who I haven't heard of before? I was really intrigued by the work you were doing at that point. I think you were maybe a year into the work. Five months. Five months. Mm -hmm. Oh, because did you start it in December of 2018? Well, I think the coalition was in April, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, In November. It was very early in my journey. And I'm so glad that that was one of the, I was introduced to you and Lisa, I mean, as prominent figures in the community by Zina Jawadi, who's now a medical student at UCLA, but was at the time a grad student at Stanford. and. She and the medical students with disability and chronic illness, as well as a lot of other people at Stanford, kind of give me, gave me like a crash course mm. in all things disability because I didn't know much. You know, I was injured in 2003 and then I spent like the next few years up until, you know, 2009 retraining in radiology from what mm. I had previously done. I was like very, busy during that time, frankly, didn't really, didn't have that much involvement with disability sort of on purpose. I would just prefer to not think about it. When I was around other disabled people, like I felt depressed. Uh, I would get sad for people, especially like that were permanent wheelchair users. I had guilt over like the recovery that I made being able to walk versus like my, the people I was in rehab with who didn't, um, you know, there was just all sort of emotion. I had like, you know, a lot of internalized and externalized ableism to get through having been like an athlete my whole life. Mm -hmm. Not like a great athlete, but you know, still like very into you know, sports and activities and very competitive. And and so I had a lot of issues to work through. I said some things about disability early on in my recovery that were probably, that, I, that make me cringe today, looking back at like prior interviews and comments I'd made. And I don't think I was... But I had been involved in a few things like board of directors of a nonprofit for disability and had done some 
like fundraisers and a few scattered things like that. I'd been interviewed for a, a couple of things, but you know, didn't really know much about disability culture or mm. philosophy. Um, and so, and really when I proposed an idea at our faculty Senate subcommittee meeting on diversity, when I proposed doing a project on disability, I really had no idea what I was proposing even. Mm. And in fact, when they asked me what I had in mind, I just told my personal story. And um, and then the group was like, oh, well, we should do it. And then they said, Pete, why don't you figure out, why don't you hear the disabled and why don't you figure out what the project would be? And as a first step, you, you know, you might want to consider doing a survey hmm. and to see the current status of things. and and start an affinity organization. And it wasn't even my idea, really. Mm. Um, it was Iris Gibbs's idea. And so I sort of took it and ran, you know, started the organization, just looking up, Googling, like, how do you start an affinity group? What are, like, some board of directors structures? What are some mission, vision statements that I believe in that resonate with me? What do we name the group? Mm. I named it the Stanford Medicine Abilities Coalition, right. SMAC, not really even realizing that it was preferred to use disability as a term rather mm. than ability. Um, I, I thought, oh, ability sounds better because disability sounds like inability or, you know, to me had like a negative connotation where ability was more inclusive and included like able-bodied allies. And so I just started meeting people around campus, talking to people, reading things, and then going to the coalition was like instrumental, mm. just learning about the specific area of like disability in healthcare and medicine, and then meeting you and Bonnie and Lisa really going from like, I don't know if it wouldn't be disability shame. I wouldn't even refer to myself as disabled before. I mean, I understood that I had a disability and I was a person with a disability, mm. but like the journey to saying that I'm disabled and saying it with pride it took a while. So I'm I'm curious because I just want to go back to what you said about even starting the group. So you you described kind of your your journey of you know kind of almost being repelled by ideas of disability. How did you go from that space of kind of not engaging disability to even being in a you know a committee space and saying we need something or maybe not even saying we need something, but here's an experience we should attend to. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I mean, I'd noticed that disability wasn't being represented in diversity efforts. It wasn't being talked about or there was no visible disability presence that I noted. The students had started um, a disability group, but I didn't even know about it. They started it like six months before I started SMAC. And um, I only found about it after, I mean, everything just kind of fell together serendipitously. I mean, the, 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 it was almost like I was at the center of it, but it was sort of forming around me. And it was almost I mean, the students really drove a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when I met, I didn't know much about disability at Stanford. I, I mean, I'd say this a lot, that I'd been treated really well by the Department of Radiology, that my residency experience had been mostly positive. And I thought that Stanford was a disability-friendly place until I met these students and like they were great in typical Stanford student fashion, like created a 15 page PDF with like a bibliography, 
Tia telling me all about like the state of disability in medicine, not just at Stanford, but nationally and giving me a primer of all these people whose readings I should, I should absorb. And so like, I mean, the thing that got me was like, that was the unfairness of the system and the negative experiences that these students were having and the discrimination that they were facing. And that just, that was the glue and like the motivation for me, really that sort of lit the fire that this should not be happening. This should not be happening at Stanford or anywhere. And so I sort of turned into a crusader at that point. Um, that was the impetus, really. Um, the unfair system, the ableist system. And I realized that it was I was lucky to have been treated like I was treated. And that it had there been another residency program director or another place or a different that it could have easily been a different outcome. You know, using political disclosure <laughs> as a way of like, you know, getting what I needed, being creative, finding win-wins, things that I've talked about in different presentations to mm. just create an environment that that would, you know, promote my success. I realized also that this was like a natural sort of niche for me. Not only would, did I have to do this work because if I didn't do it, maybe nobody else would. But a feeling that this could be good for my career. This is a space that where I have maybe like the most credibility and the most potential for impact, where there's a vacuum. Hmm. And the students had a lot of great ideas where we could like devote our energy. Zena had a lot of great ideas. I met the disability people here at Stanford, the Stanford Disability Initiative, and people who are in charge of that and part of that in the disability and access office and the office of accessible education, the relationships also meant a lot. Um, the relationships with people at Stanford and people outside of Stanford and like the warmth that I felt from the community, how welcoming all of you guys were to this, oh. this dude that nobody knew well, it's, it's interesting. I, I, I just want to go back to what you said about kind of finding the space of, of leadership. And it's an interesting equation because you talked about, you know, on the one hand being kind of activated by the injustice that you became aware of. And I think that's kind of that critical consciousness raising moment of whoa, like what you said about, I was lucky. Like if, if I had been in a different situation, if I had played the game slightly differently, if I had had the wrong program director, the wrong whoever in the mix, my experience could be really different. And I think that's an important and powerful kind of realization that, um, you know, some people might say, oh, that's, you know, if you knew how to do it right, you wouldn't have those problems. And what I hear you saying is something different, like, oh, I could have easily been in that situation, which I think is really important. And then the other piece is the thought that this might be a space I could benefit from being a leader in. And it's interesting because we know that kind of being out, being public, taking that role can also be dangerous, right? And it may not, you know, for a lot of people, there's a fear that leading, being public will tank their careers. And it takes in the, the courage, the, the viewpoint that actually this could be a good thing. 
you know, you say that maybe that's selfish, but also um, I think that courage, that ability to see the positive potential of it is kind of what's necessary to lead. Like the, the combination of the recognizing the systemic injustice plus this could be good for me and for other mm-hmm. people allows you to step into a space that previously you had not wanted to inhabit i you know it it can feel uncomfortable to talk about that but i there's something really powerful about that about being able to see that that's possible and and maybe part of it is that you can't hide your disability right it's apparent and so you're already out there why not take it up and if you don't take it up people are going to ask why not Potentially. Well, and it's, I look at it as a duty. I mean, it's not, it's an obligation also. I, yeah. I feel like I, I really, I don't have a choice and it would be like an incredible, I'd be doing an incredible disservice. And I think it would be like a failure of leadership and a, a failure of courage if I didn't continue doing this work. Like I have a title, you know, I'm a clinical associate professor, radiology at Stanford. And although that title, you know, is not, I don't have that written on my wall. I don't look, <laughs> at, don't look at it every day and think about, you know, how grand it is. But I, you know, it does offer me like a key to certain spaces that I wouldn't have otherwise. And it allows me to to be that voice and to advocate for other people, especially people who are in lower positions of power, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. students and residents. And, um, you know, it just, eh. so it's a duty. It's interesting because like a lot of the other wrinkle in this is that I chose to not continue taking care of patients in a clinical sense. I mean, I do view my work as like directly with or for patients in radiology, reading their scans. But, you know, a lot of what I talk about when I talk about disability in medicine is like the uh, the clinical part of it, like the empathy and compassion that people with disabilities have, having been in the on the other side of the stethoscope, the other side of the curtain. And I do think that we bring a lot to that area. The expectations for doctors with disabilities is both nuanced and complex. In a 2018 study aptly titled Being on Both Sides, Dr. Sturgiopoulos and colleagues explore the complexity of identity negotiation for docs with disabilities, citing that at a structural level, practitioners engage in strategic disclosure in a medical culture, which often equates illness with weakness and incompetency. Listen in as Drs. Jane and Poulos explore the contours of this gray area. I think it's interesting what you are talking about because, you know, this is something I struggle with in terms of how we position the research and the work. You know, you talked about the, you know, one of the big arguments for doctors with disabilities is um, empathy, lived experience what that can do to um, clinical work. And I think the, the danger of that argument is kind of this essentializing idea of like what it means to be a doctor with a disability. You, you have to be more than a doctor. You have to bring this kind of quote unquote special ability to the encounter. And I think it's, it's true of many doctors with disabilities. They are bringing that lived experience to the work. But what you're describing is is a complicated knot, right? Like, because you kind of hinted to 
feeling like you wanted to demonstrate that you could do everything while simul simultaneously questioning, am I practicing safely? Am I really doing everything that I need to as a clinician? And yet questioning whether you could do so safely. Is this even sensible to be directing someone to move your stethoscope? And feeling that conflict between here's my argument for what disabled doctors can do to patient care, but I'm not doing the clinical patient interactions anymore. And I think that's kind of a, there's some friction for me in the argument around what disabled doctors bring to medicine, because I think, yes, the empathy in the patient encounter, the kind of different level of understanding, the connection, the lived knowledge that comes with living with a disability is incredibly important. And yet, if we essentialize that, it raises questions that you've, it sounds like you've grappled with, which is like, what, am, what does it mean if I'm not doing that? And yet, to me, it sounds incredibly sensible. It's like, you have found a niche for yourself that works well, you can practice medicine. And I mean, not that everyone needs to do this, but you are a leader in a movement. You've taken the power that you have as a faculty member and channeled that into improving systems, raising awareness, all of those things. But I, yeah, I guess I guess I'm wondering, have you thought about that kind of tension in the argument around empathy? Oh, so this is very interesting, actually. So have you heard of Chat GPT? No. This AI that they say is going to make make writing obsolete and make mm. um, the high school essay a thing of the past. Well, you should go to Chat GPT and talk to it. Okay. And I was I read about this and I talked to him the other night or her it. And I said, what makes doctors with disabilities more effective than those without? This is just my question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the AI says, it is not necessarily the case that doctors with disabilities are more effective than those without. The ability to provide effective medical care is dependent on many factors, including a doctor's training, experience, and overall proficiency in their field. In some cases, doctors with disabilities may be able to bring unique perspectives and experiences to their work that can enhance their ability to provide care. But this is not always the case. Ultimately, the effectiveness of a doctor should be determined by their individual abilities and qualifications rather than their disability status. Fascinating. Fascinating. Yeah. And then I said, well, what are some of those unique perspectives? And the AI says, well, that's difficult to say. But... And could vary depending on the individual and their specific disability. However, you know, some possible examples may include a deeper understanding of the challenges that patients may face, personal experience with accommodations and assistive technologies that can be helpful, insight into the psychological and emotional impact of living with disability, and how that can affect a person's health and well-being. But again, it's important to note that not all doctors with disabilities will necessarily have these perspectives and that the effectiveness of a doctor should be determined by their individual abilities and qualifications. And I just thought that is so smart. Chat GPT knows. My God. My God. And I, you know, this conversation went on. Of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but like, it was like, it was like talking to your smartest friend, really. It was just, what about I, does having a disability even make a person more empathic or compassionate? The, the chat AI says no, that not necessarily, that these are complex psychological traits and that there are many factors that go into it. It also points out that some people without disabilities may also have high levels of empathy and compassion. 
It's interesting, you know, Duncan Shrewsbury, but they're a doc in, a disabled doc in, in the UK, and they do research in the space. And they often push back on that argument about doctors with disabilities being more empathetic because they say, why are we basing inclusion on that argument? People mm-hmm. have a right to participate and and that should be central and anything that comes after that is, as ChatGPT has told us, complex. <laughs> Envisioning a future of equity in medicine is a tall order, one that requires us to challenge the status quo. What would the future of medicine look like if individuals were encouraged to glean insight from their lived experience into praxis? Here, Dr. Jane and Dr. Poulos explore the possibilities that could exist for the future of medicine. You know, you described yourself like early in your disability experience, kind of how you thought about disability, your reaction to disabled people, which was complicated. The internalized ableism that we all carry from living in an ableist society to suggest that there's an essential criticality or knowledge base that disabled people have, I think is a is a complicated question, especially when we know that the education that medical students get is more often than not, not anti-ableist. And students are socialized into a space and, and asked to let go of their criticality in their training. You know, we see the work from Dr. Yaris's team, from Irene Sturgiopoulos, Dr. Sturgiopoulos's work, that shows, you know, even folks who want to incorporate their lived experience into their practice and training are really wrestling with those questions of professionalism because it's not part of training to to support people to do that work. And so it feels like a dangerous act, you know, like political disclosure. It's a dangerous mm-hmm. act to to disclose, to to incorporate your lived experience into training. And so on the one hand, you know, I think it's this complicated space of like, it, it is, I think it's a valid argument and yet it's not always valid. Should we be hanging our argument? And if we are hanging our argument on that, what are we doing to ensure that all trainees are supported in activating critical disability right. ideas in their practice? Well, it's like, why should I have to be more empathic and compassionate than someone else? Do I really have to be better than an able-bodied person at my job? Or can I just be the same? Or maybe even a little bit worse. I don't know. (laughs) I I, Like, I hate the curb cut Mm. argument. It's good for everyone. And even people with strollers with their babies. It's like, why does it have to be good for everyone? Yeah. Why can't it just be like a human right and good enough to be for us? You know, there is a lot of that argument going on. And I also struggle with that. And I mean, taken to the extreme, I've said to in the definitely intentional provocativeness of the statement to say that we shouldn't even let students without disabilities matriculate to medical school (laughs) because they don't have the lived experience of what it's like to be a patient. Yeah. What would, what would that do to medicine? Right. What would that do to medicine? I don't know. I would think that it would make it better that there would be positive changes. But again, as ChatGPT says, it depends on the individual. And it can also be true that people with disabilities can be less empathetic and compassionate than non-disabled people because of this idea like, what are you complaining about? Mm-hmm. Look what I have to go through on mm-hmm. a day-to-day basis just to like get out of bed and mm-hmm. get to work. Or I've you done know? it. 
why is it so hard for you? You know? Right. Exactly. So it can go the other way also. And I think that's where, at least in my mind, and I, and I don't know that we know what it would do to medicine. And I think it could do a lot of different things as you, as you describe, like it's not a guarantee that it would improve medicine. But to me, if we started from that premise, if medicine said, you can't be a doctor unless you have lived experience, tell us your lived experience, tell us how it influences your work. It would, on some level, that if we started from that premise, then that shifts so many things that are right now kind of core to medicine. So it might, a system that started from that premise, I would think, would look a lot different because there would be, theoretically, attention to how do we engage that. There would be attention to, uh, you know, it would be destigmatized de because everyone would have had some experience. So maybe it's more okay to talk about it. But I think, you know, of course, I can imagine all the ways it could go wrong. <laughs> but I'd like to, you know, I think as a thought experiment, it's an interesting idea of like, what else would change in the system if we started from that point? What else could be possible through that fundamental assumption? I mean, I have to think that it would change things for the better. Be sure to listen to part two of this important conversation. Here's an excerpt where Drs. Jane and Poulos dive deeper and discuss the power of community and cross-movement building. That's one of the most important things in this space is the, is the relationships that you build with other leaders in the community. Yeah. And one of the most gratifying aspects of the job because the people who are working in the disability are, and the diversity spaces are some of like the coolest people mm. I know. The most open-minded and progressive and accepting Thank you, Drs. Jane and Poulos, for this incredible conversation about disability identity and for sharing a perspective on docs with disabilities in medicine. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us, and please join us for part two of this interview. If you enjoyed this discussion, be sure to subscribe to our podcast, check out our previous interviews, and tune in again next time. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative, and is supported in part by the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M Disability Initiative, the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, non-derivative license. This episode was produced by Lisa Meeks, Kadisha Trico, and Jacob Feeman. <laughs>